So, hello and welcome to Windows in Time, Stories of Southern Oregon Heritage, Heritage Trees, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pastizo, Digital Services Specialist. This program is being recorded, so once again, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure quality recording. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Latgawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, as well as of the Crow Cow Creek Band of Umpquat Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. The result of forced relocation and genocide is that Jackson County is no longer a population center for these specific tribal groups. As of the 2020 census, 4.6% of the population of Jackson County has some indigenous heritage. While this is more than twice the national average, it is a precipitous reduction from the pre-colonial 100%. We acknowledge that indigenous groups are too often relegated to the historical past when, in truth, indigenous people are essential members of the Jackson County community. We take this moment to recognize the indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands and hunting grounds are where residents of Jackson County live today. We encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty of indigenous people. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Today's presenter is Nancy Appling. For seven years, Nancy Appling lectured for the Oregon Council for the Humanities and talked about trees in every Oregon county. During that tenure, Nancy joined the Oregon Heritage Tree Program, where she continues to serve as the Southern Oregon representative now in her 20th year. Thank you, Nancy, for being with us today. As she mentioned, I'm a member of the Oregon State Heritage Tree Committee, and we have a saying at the committee that trees tie us to our historical roots. Trees became the cornerstone of our economy during the state's infancy. Um, these trees are associated with events such as the Oregon Trail, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps, World War II, and the Apollo missions, space missions. Consider that without trees, Lewis and Clark may never have made it to Oregon because they relied on dugout canoes made of cottonwoods. <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep you awake by asking questions <laughs> throughout here. <laughs> and I do empathize with that PowerPoint. Oh, and me. Okay. Oh, that works. Oregon's trees have stories to tell if we take a moment to listen. They are living witnesses to exploration and progress, solidarity and remembrance, adversity and resiliency. So today I will speak for the trees and take you on a tour across the state with a focus on the Southern area because the program's called Southern Oregon Trees, introducing you to some of Oregon's compelling heritage trees. Many of these I researched and nominated myself, um, happily nominated. The Oregon Heritage Tree Program was founded in 1996, becoming the first state-sponsored heritage tree program in the country. It's worth noting that there are many cities with heritage or significant tree programs, but there are few states. Oregon is unique. Rather than heritage tree programs, states often have champion tree lists that show the largest trees of each species. The Oregon Heritage Tree Program, however, specifically links trees to stories of Oregon's people, eras, ways of life, diverse cultures, and they act as arboreal witnesses. Though many of these trees are old and large, many are not. Um, we're a 15-member volunteer committee as part of the Oregon Travel Information Council. Talk a little closer to the mic. Thank you. Okay. Um, our committee is comprised of both tree people, that's me, and historians, sort of me. 
We review the heritage tree nominations for historical accuracy and the tree's connections to Oregon histories. Um, our first dedication ceremony was held in 1997, and we now hold dedication ceremonies every spring during Arbor Week. Thus far, we have nearly 100 registered state heritage trees. So to be a state, oops, you're all welcome to say click if I forget to click ahead. <laughs> uh, to be an Oregon heritage tree, a tree must meet at least one of those four criteria, preferably all four. We're a really picky committee. Um, just because my parents planted an apple tree when I was born, it doesn't mean that that would qualify as a heritage tree. The apple tree was an appropriate choice with my name of Appling, but there's no connection to statewide history or interest. So bear in mind, these have historical connections. Um, heritage trees grow throughout the state. And as shown in our heritage markers and heritage tree guide, um, we have a map where you can see where the trees are. And I recommend you all take at least two of these before you leave and keep them in your car. So when you're driving around the state, you can say, oh, I think there's a tree nearby. Let's go look at this heritage tree. And do you know what the beaver boards are? We call them beaver boards um, back in the day. They're the heritage markers. So there's a heritage marker committee and the heritage tree committee. We, we get together every now and then. Um, so since this program is about our fascinating Southern Oregon trees, let's first head to the coast. Um, click. Okay, Shore Acres. You all been to Shore Acres? Oh, good. Beautiful gardens, great Monterey pine tree, um, place to camp, kayak in the, uh, the bay there. Uh, in 2002, the Shore Acres Monterey pine in Charleston was recognized as the largest of its species in the United States by the National Register of Heritage Trees. The tree was planted by the Simpson family as part of their extensive estate. Lewis Simpson was a lumberman and ship, ship builder who expanded his father's companies and eventually donated the land for Shore Acres. He was a founder of North Bend and served as the city's first mayor. When the Great Depression took a heavy toll, Simpson went bankrupt in 1940. He sold his coastal properties to the state of Oregon to be used as state parks, becoming Sunset Beach, Shore Acres, and Cape Arago. So this gentleman here, right on the corner, you, <laughs> uh, walked in and from about 10 feet back, he said, oh, that's a Jeffrey Pine. <laughs> and he had a good eye because the one next to it is a Ponderosa. And they look very similar, don't they? I'll explain why in a minute. Um, the, this Jeffrey Pine, the smoke jumper tree, is located at the historic Siskiyou Smoke Jumper Base in the Illinois Valley at the airport. The Smoke Jumper Base was one of four built in the early 1940s. The Aerial Firefighter Program used aircraft to carry firefighters into remote regions where they parachuted to wildfires that were most often started by lightning. We still do that today. A small crew of two or four could be could put out a fire while it was relatively easy to control. The base's location was likely influenced by the incendiary bomb that was dropped near Brookings in 1942. Many people at that time believed that the Japanese intended to wage war on American soil by starting forest fires because the base was established when most of the able-bodied men were overseas fighting, um, conscientious objectors were often recruited as the workforce. The largest number of these men were from farms and had never even been in an airplane. When the war ended, smoke jumper firefighting jobs were given to returning veterans, um, mostly the airborne paratroopers. During the Cold War era in the 1950s, the base was upgraded, the government constructed new buildings, and the number of firefighting crews increased dramatically. Many of the trees on the base were removed, but one Jeffrey Pine 
was spared, most likely to serve as a telephone pole, and it still has the old glass insulators attached to it. Um, so how do we tell the difference between a Jeffrey and a Ponderosa? He says, feel it. Very good. This is a tr good tree group. So General Jeffrey, out, out, out. Prickly Ponderosa. Prickly Ponderosa and Gentle Jeffrey. So the next time you're heading to the coast on Highway, Highway 199, be sure to stop at the uh, Smoke Jumper Base. The museum is amazing. They have parachutes, they have the old uh, sewing machines that they sewed the parachutes with. They, have, they show you how uh, to pack up parachute so it opens when you need it to. Um, it's, an, it's an interesting, worth a stop. Um, as an aside, there's also a connection between this tree and another heritage tree. Oh, sorry, I don't have a slide for that. Um, a moon tree. As a young man, Stuart Russo worked as a smoke jumper in the Pacific Northwest for the Forest Service and he developed close ties to Coos Bay. Later in the 60s, he became a NASA astronaut. And in 1971, he was a crew member on Apollo 14. In that capsule, Rusa stashed 600 seeds from five tree species, loblolly pine, sycamore, sweet gum, redwood, and Douglas fir. Um, the intention was to test the effects of zero gravity on those seeds. So when he returned, the Forest Service, got, Forest Service got the seeds and they attempted germination and all of those seeds grew into healthy trees and were subsequent, the seeds, the rest of the seeds were uh, subsequently um, awarded to federal and state agencies, universities, state capitals and foreign countries. Two of the original Douglas fir moon trees planted in Oregon grow at the state capitol and at OSU. Um, notice that many of the seeds were planted next to their earthbound counterpoints, uh, counterparts, and there was virtually no difference in um, the way they grew the moon trees versus the ones that the seedlings that never got to travel. In the picture on our upper right, did that guy land in the tree? That it kind of looks like that, doesn't it? Yeah, those those darn things get tangled up. Yeah. Yeah, and they're required to get those parachutes out of those trees. Um, the bomb site tree. Yes. Okay. Um, going back over to the coast in Brookings. In 1992, a coastal redwood was planted at the site of the only Japanese aerial bombing of the continental United States in September, 1942. The tree was planted in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the bombing. And it was planted by, spider running across here. It was planted by the Japanese pilot, Nobu Fujita, who flew the submarine delivered reconnaissance airplane that dropped the incendiary bomb. Picture a submarine coming to the surface with a, uh, the ability to launch an airplane. Um, the incendiary drop bomb was dropped in retaliation for the Doolittle raid on Tokyo in 1942. It was thought that these bombs would ignite forest fires. Fortunately, the typically tender, dry coastal range um, received rain, had recently received a lot of rainfall and a dense fog in the days preceding the attack, and the small fires were quickly extinguished. But this incident is the one that inspired the location of the smoke jumper base close into the coastal range. 20 years after the war, the Brookings Harbor JCs invited Mr. Fujita to their Azalea Festival. Japanese council staff were suspicious that if Mr. Fujita came to the United States, he might be tried as a war criminal. Um, they were assured, however, that it would be a visit to promote peace and friendship between Japan and the United States. So in spite of the furor, 
that arose when the invitation was first announced. Mr. Fujita, his wife, and two children attended the festival and were warmly received. At this first festival, Fujita presented his family's 400-year-old samurai sword to the city of Brookings as a gesture of peace and goodwill. Um, the sword remains on, the dis on display at the Brookings Library. Have any of you seen, seen the sword? See, I'm getting a trip for you. Shore Acres. <laughs> Illinois Valley, <laughs> proteins. Um, in 1985, the Fujita family sponsored three Brookings High School students at their, um, as exchange students, as their guests in Japan. And in 1992, um, when he planted the redwood at, at the bomb site, just days before he died, Mr. Fujita was named an honorary citizen of Brookings, and his ashes are scattered near the bomb site. Okay, let's take a break from ministry lessons for a few minutes. Um, can you name those trees? There are only three trees there. The one on the left, those are bonsais of that species. The one in the middle is a different one, and then there's a bonsai of the one above it. So, everybody know what this one on the left is? So thank you, <laughs> Sequoia. Um, let's see, and the middle one. There, I heard it, say that again. Don Redwood. And the one over on the right. Coastal Redwood. So you've just named the three redwood trees. And I imagine you don't agree with Ronald Reagan, who said, if you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. <laughs> Clearly, if you've seen one redwood tree, you have not seen them all. <laughs> Thank you. You did very well. Whoever said fur. Hmm. Um, okay, let's talk about Don Redwoods. Um, although we now know that Don Redwoods graced the landscape of the Norman northern temperate regions during the time of the dinosaurs, late Cretaceous period. But until the 1940s, the Don Redwood, anybody know the Latin name? She gets an A. Metasequoia gypsostroboides. <laughs> That's a tongue twister. Glyptostroboides. Um, it was believed extinct. Um, Fossils were first discovered in 1941 in Japan, and then three years later, live trees were found in China. Click, nobody said click. There we go. Um, in 1947, Harvard's Arnold Arboretum arranged for seeds to be collected in China. Uh, these seeds were then dispersed to several institutions in the United States, and Portland's White Arboretum was one of the recipients and the seeds were planted. Um, just four years later, the Hoyt's Don Redwood became the first to produce cones in the Western Hemisphere in six million years. Wow. And you can see it. It's at the Hoyt, up by the gift shop. <laughs> so we're feeling good. So why are these um, seemingly dead and dying trees in the picture? Let other people get <laughs> some they answer. Lose their in they do. They lose their needles in the winter. They're deciduous. Um, I can attest to how quickly these trees grow. I planted three in my backyard here in Medford, and they are now bearing cones. They're about 25 feet. So what's this? It's a fern. It's a... No, we're, we're still on that tree. We're still on that tree. <laughs> it's a dawn. Okay, now I'll click. Um, 
heading back to the Rogue Valley, let's learn how some of these Don Redwood seeds eventually ended up at nearby Hanley Farm. Um, are any of you familiar with the farm? Oh, good. I, I recognize two people who volunteer there with me on a regular basis. Hi, Tom. Hi, Liz. <laughs> um, the farm is owned by the Southern Oregon Historic Society, uh, and they sponsor this Windows in Time program. So, um, and volunteers are always needed. We have a lot of fun out there with lots of projects, everything from weekly gardening to uh, scarecrow festivals and um, many, many events. In 1857, Michael, Martha and Michael Hanley settled uh, near Jacksonville when it was still a remote outpost of European Americans. Prior to that era, um, the area was a popular tribal hunting and gathering ground. Artifacts dating back 3,000 years have been found on the Hanley Farm property. And we have an archeologist on our team who keeps a real close eye on us. So if we're going to plant a tree, like we recently planted two Heinz walnuts, uh, the archeologist was there sifting the soil for us to make sure we didn't miss any um, artifacts. And um, I think we found 43 in a very small area that we dug. So arrowheads, chip pieces of pottery. Um, it's a really important place. Um, from the first years of the farmstead, the Hanleys managed to acquire exotic plants, a tradition the family continued for almost 130 years. In 1860, early on, Martha Hanley planted a weeping willow to commemorate the birth of her son, Bill. The willow cutting was obtained from the Pioneer Llewellyn Nursery in the Willamette Valley and was delivered by Martha's friend, Kit Kearney, an express writer who stuck it in a potato to keep it from drying out. Um, the tree flourished beside the spring and the Hanley Farmstead eventually became known as the Willows. And that sticking uh, cuttings in potatoes was a very common practice coming over on the Oregon Trail because it would keep it moist, not necessarily for the whole six months, but um, it was a good way uh, to keep and a lot of the um, women brought cuttings from their rose bushes and some of their favorite plants that they just didn't want to leave behind, reminded them of home. Uh, Martha and Michael's daughter, Alice, continued planting, as did her niece, Claire, to whom the property was eventually deeded. Um, the Hamleys were close friends with nearby Peter Britt, and they shared plants, even competing for rare finds including the Dawn Redwood that the Hanleys acquired. In 1940, the 80, at 80 years old, the Hanley willow tipped over. Although it is now recumbent, its roots still live and draw moisture from the nearby spring. Shoots have sprung up from the base of the tree over the past eight decades, forming its new trunk. Um, legend has it that the tree lost large limbs when two of the Hanley girls died and then finally tipped when Alice, the last of the three Hanley girls, passed. Um, in 1948, Claire sold 80 acres of the farm for use as OSU's Southern Oregon Experiment Station. Part of the track used for display of ornamentals became the Claire Hanley Arboretum. Uh, the property known as the Willows passed through generations of Hanley women before the Southern Oregon Historic Society acquired it in 1986. Today, the society continues to refine its management plan for what is now called Hanley Farm and is a popular site for the community events, seasonal festivals, and serves as an educational facility for adults and children. We have a children's heritage fair, uh, lots going on at Hanley. The property is managed by volunteers. I'm the current garden manager and encourage you to inquire about volunteer opportunities at Hanley Farm. We do have fun. And speaking of Peter Britt, he, became, he began developing his famous Britt Gardens during the height of Jacksonville's 1850 gold rush. While he is best known as Southern Oregon's pioneer photographer, 
Britt was also one of Southern Oregon's most skilled horticulturalists. He imported new varieties of plants from around the world and turned the grounds into a showplace of exotic greenery. From his Jacksonville gardens, Britt pioneered Southern Oregon's multi-million dollar fruit industry with plantings of pear, peach, apple, and grapes. By 1880, early on, he was producing 3,000 gallons of wine per year, eventually filling orders from as far away as Wyoming. In March of 1862, the day of Ritz's son Emil's birth, Peter planted one of Oregon's first giant sequoia trees along the Britt water ditch. A significant question right now is how did Peter Britt obtain the seedling only a few years after that species was first identified in the Sierra Mountains of Central California where they are native? After the death, death of Britt's last heir in 1959, the 80-acre Britt estate was willed to Southern Oregon College. The Britt house burned a year later. Jackson County Parks Department purchased 10 acres, including the Britt Sequoia. If you take a hike around the property, it's real easy to find the tree and to continue on, um, I guess that's sort of Northwest on the trail. From its vantage point, this majestic tree has witnessed the unfolding of Jacksonville's rich history from the gold rush of the mid 1800s to the decline at the turn of the century to its current revitalization. Pardon? Okay, so we're in Jacksonville. Let's head east to um, the Beale Black Walnut. Um, it's, it's basically a mile north of Hanley Farm to Beale, Beale Lane, I think. Um, in 1852, the brothers Robert and Thomas Beale, or do you pronounce it Bell? There's always some controversy. It's Bell. Okay, that's official. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, Beeler Bell, but that, that sounds pretty good. Um, the Bell Brothers broke existing records for mule train travel on the Oregon Trail, um, competing the trek in 78 days when the average was four to six months. They were moving. They often traded with Dr. John McLaughlin, the father of Oregon, who had a store at the end of the Oregon Trail in Oregon City. Soon the Bells started packing supplies into Southern Oregon miners. Um, in 1864, Bell planted an Illinois walnut, one that has continued to thrive for nearly 150 years in the rich bottom soil of Central Point. Today, the walnut tree is the second largest in the United States. Um, and it's on Bell Lane, just near the railroad tracks on, on Highway 99. Um, on Belling. It's worth a drive out to see this majestic tree that um, really dwarfs the, the house there. <laughs> and the, the um, residents have done an amazing job of, of paying for arbor care on that tree. I guess, of course, they're concerned about it falling on the house. <laughs> and driving down Highway 99 towards um, Metro, just a little bit past the library here, um, to the Jackson and Perkins, Perry and David property. It's likely that the first pear tree saplings arrived in the Rogue Valley from the Llewellyn nursery, which I mentioned earlier. Growth of horticulture in the Rogue Valley dates to 1852, when gold was discovered in Jacksonville. At that time, miners and settlers clamored for fresh fruit. Commercial pear production finally took off with the arrival of the railroad in 1888. Harry and David produced high quality fruit and were innovative marketers, shipping comis, which they renamed Royal Riviera, uh, shipping them worldwide. In 1936, Harry and David started the first Fruit of the Month Club, a marketing idea that, quote, brought unexpected prosperity to the once busted Rogue Valley. 
Um, ten trees remain of this original planting, known as Bear Creek Orchards Block 1A. Um, these heritage trees can be seen um, at the back of the rose garden. There's a shed, an equipment shed, and then there's the, uh, the trees. And they're hanging in there. I think I nominated them about 20 years ago. Every time I drive by, I wonder oh, how many are left. Pardon? And it's awfully wet there in, in the soil. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, let's just continue down um, 99 into Ashland. Um, the McCall Magnolia was planted in front of the Ashland home of John and Mary Elizabeth McCall in memory of John's daughter, Elise, who died in 1890. While a Southern Magnolia's lifespan can be greater than 100 years, it's rare that this species will thrive that long in our climate. Too hot, not moist enough. The tree now towers over the grand home built by the McCall family. The house still contains some of the original furniture and is a very popular bed and breakfast in Ashland. McCall began as a gold prospector, but realizing an opportunity, started offering wares and services to federal mi fellow miners, establishing the Ashland Mercantile. That business was followed by various enterprises, including the Ashland Woolen Mills, the Bank of Ashland, Ashland Library, and the local newspaper, uh, the Ashland Daily Tidings. As Ashland's mayor, John was instrumental in ensuring the railroad came through Ashland rather than Klamath Falls. He built his new home inside of the railroad station where it became a center of hospitality. John's first wife was Teresa Applegate from the prominent pioneer family whose vast holdings inspired the naming of the Applegate Valley and the trail. Beginning in 1846, many settlers coming into the Rogue Valley Traverse the Applegate Trail, named for her family. After Teresa's death in 1875, John married Mary Elizabeth Lizzie Anderson. She had traveled by ox cart from Missouri and became a local teacher. After their marriage, Lizzie parented John's children, including Elsie, for whom the magnolia was planted. Oh, it's a lovely tree. Lizzie continued an interesting life after John's death. In 1896, she became postmistress of Ashland and the first telegraph operator in Southern Oregon. She ran both the post office and the telegraph office from the front, front parlor of McCall House, keeping watch over the growing magnolia tree. Uh, she was also a, a very active suffragette in her, until her death. Okay. Now we're on to my favorite trees. Um, I'm slipping out of Southern Oregon, as you can tell by that picture. Does anybody know where we are? Steens Mountains, yes. Um, this was the most fun project to research and to nominate for tree. Um, the carvings in this aspen grove are called arbor glyphs, sometimes dendroglyphs, arbor trees, dendro trees. Um, most of the arbor glyphs in Oregon were carved by Basque sheep herders who worked the top of the Steens Mountains in the early, mid, early to mid 20th century. Until the Taylor Grazing Act in 1934, the Steens were open range for up to 100,000 sheep, about 2,000 per herd. During the summer, herders followed sh the sheep for miles each day and slept in tents. Using pocket knives or nails, they carved names, dates, messages, poems, some risque drawings um, into the soft barks of the aspens with the intention of letting other sheep herders know who passed by. It's sort of a little telegraph office. <laughs> Sometimes the shepherds would etch the name of their hometowns, make notes about the sheep, or even leave comments about their future hopes and dreams. Eventually, some men returned to the Basque region in northern Spain. Others married and became um, residents and citizens here. 
this was, as I said, it was the most fun tree for me to nominate, but grove of trees. The tree committee often all go to the dedications that we have. So we had to go to French Glen and um, we stayed at the French Glen Hotel and it was about a half hour drive up into the Steens to this grove that had the most carvings. Uh, and so we had publicized the, the event and the Basque sheep herders uh, descendants came over from Winnemucca, Nevada for this amazing um, dedication. And they were so honored. They brought one of their, I call it a gypsy wagon, but that's not right. Um, a Basque wagon, it was beautifully painted and carved and, uh, and they prepared fantastic food for us. It was, it was really a lot of fun. So um, I'm always looking for trees out that far east. If anybody knows of any, but any, any trees out there, um, we'd certainly like to have more Eastern Oregon trees in the program. I'm not going to talk about that. It's really hard to hear you. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of the little tour. Um, now I'm going to explain how you can get involved and nominate uh, some trees. Um, you can nominate or how you can get involved in the program. You can nominate a tree. One of the easiest ways to get involved is by discovering a historic tree. If you're aware of a potential candidate, check out the nomination form. There's a picture of it right there um, on our website. Um, nominate an award winner. Another way the Heritage Tree Committee educates Oregonians is by recognizing exceptional Oregon citizens. Um, and we have two award programs. One is the Maynard Drossen Lifetime Achievement Award that we've, we've only had three winners um, over the, the lifetime of these programs. And Frank Callahan, local, local gentleman um, from Central Point was the recipient in 2022. He's a botanist, nursery owner, big tree hunter and preservationist. Frank has found 28 champion tree species in Oregon, champion tree species. Those are the big ones. And over 80 champion trees in the Western United States. He hunted big trees with his family and with his longtime friend and the renowned fellow big tree hunter, Maynard Drossen. Frank not only hunted big trees, he, continu he continued Drossen's legacy by planting trees. In April, um, Callahan planted two specimen sized Heinz walnut trees at Hanley Farm, and he had started those seeds from, started those trees from seed. We had walnut trees planted by the Hanley family, but they aged out, and one of them toppled right into the area where we have um, public events. So it was time to um, get rid of those um, walnut trees. It was heartbreaking to cut one down, but it was better that was done before it fell down. So because of the archeological heritage, we had to plant walnut trees again. So these are Heinz walnuts uh, and they are grafted and they should live another 150 years. So we're okay now. Um, I have some information and even some handouts if anybody's really interested about Frank. He has um, quite a history. The Heritage Tree Hero Award recognizes people who teach the importance of trees and raise awareness about Oregon's history uh, as told through trees and forests. So our 2022 Heritage Tree Hero winner, winner is a great example. Dara Kramer, a teacher at Gardner Middle School in Oregon City, merged her passion for education and trees when a 300-year-old 60-foot native white oak on the school's property was threatened by construction. They wanted to take the tree down to build a schoolroom. 
At her inspiration, the students rallied and saved the trees. When Kramer worked to nominate the tree as an Oregon City Heritage Tree, she also used the tree to give the students of Gardner lessons in arborist education, botany, math, biology, public fundraising, and public speaking. Um, Kramer recruited the school's science and work, woodworking classes to use the fallen limbs from an ice storm in 2021 to make interpretive signage uh, that will continue to educate the future students and the public. Another way to get involved is to find out if your city or county has a local heritage tree program. I know several of our cities here, Medford, Ashland, um, Talent, not so sure about Phoenix, um, have, here, have significant tree programs and you can get involved there. I'm sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, if you want to know more, don't leave yet. We have a test. Um, if you want to know more, please visit our website, which has an interactive map and photos of all the heritage trees. That